got another great one for you. I can't wait. Um, have you ever wondered where the phrase flying saucer or flying disc came from? It was from an original UFO sighting by a pilot by the name of Kenneth Arnold way back in the day, back in the 1950s. Not only is this a fascinating case, and not only was he the first one to describe these flying objects as flying discs, uh, what's really amazing is there was a gentleman on the ground who also saw the exact same thing, gave the exact same description of what he saw that matched Kenneth Arnold's description. Not only that, the, the Air Force and the United States government took this report very, very seriously and did actually do an investigation. I think you will find this absolutely fascinating. This is from the original radio program that Kenneth Arnold did right after the sighting. So in his own words, I'm going to let him describe to you what happened that day, what he saw, it's amazing. It will blow you away. And by the way, the Hollywood version of flying saucers and flying disc is not what he saw. Newscaster in every newspaper across the nation has made headlines out of it. And this afternoon, we are honored indeed to have here in our studio this man, Kenneth Arnold, who we believe may be able to give us a first-hand account and give you the same on what happened. Kenneth, first of all, if you'll move up here to the microphone just a little closer, uh, we'll ask you uh, to just tell in your own fashion, as you told us last night in your hotel room and again this morning, uh, what you were doing there and how this entire thing started. Go ahead, Kenneth. Well, at about uh, 2.15, I took off from Chehalis, Washington, en route to Yakima. And, of course, every time that any of us fly over the country near Mount Rainier, we spend an hour or two in search of the marine plane that's never been found that they believe is in the snow someplace southwest of that particular area. That area is located at about, or <coughs> its elevation is about 10,000 foot. And I had made one sweep in close to Mount Rainier and down one of the canyons and was dragging it for any types of object that might prove to be the marine ship. Uh, and as I come out uh, of the canyon there, it was about 15 minutes. I was approximately 25 to 28 miles from Mount Rainier. I climbed back up to 9,200 feet and I noticed to the left of me a chain which looked to me like the tail of a Chinese kite, uh, kind of weaving and going at a terrific speed across the face of Mount Rainier. I uh, at first uh, thought they were geese because it flew like geese, but it was going so fast that, that uh, I immediately changed my mind and decided it was a bunch of new jet planes in formation. Well, as the, as the planes come to the edge of Mount Rainier, flying at about 160 degrees south, uh, I... Uh, thought I would clock them because it was such a clear day and uh, I didn't know where their destination was but uh, due to the fact that I had Mount St. Helens and Mount Adams to clock them by I just thought I'd see just how fast they were going since among pilots we argue about speed so much and uh, uh, they seemed to flip and flash in the sun just like a mirror and uh, in fact I happened to be at an angle from the sun that seemed to hit the tops of these uh, peculiar looking things in such a way that it, it almost blinded you when you when you looked at at them through your plexiglass windshield. Well, uh, I uh, it was about one minute to three when uh, I st I <coughs> started clocking them on my uh, my sweet second hand clock, and uh, as I kept looking at them, I kept looking for their tails. They didn't have any tails. <laughs> I thought, well, <laughs> maybe I something's wrong with my eyes. And I turned the, the plane around and opened the window and looked out the window and. Sure enough, I couldn't find any tails on them. And uh, the whole uh, observation of these particular ships didn't last more than about two and a half minutes. And I could see them only plainly when uh, they seemed to tip their wing or whatever it was, and the sun flashed on them. They looked something like uh, a pie plate that was cut in half with a sort of a convex triangle in the rear. Now, I thought, well, uh, that maybe their jet planes with just the, pa the tails painted green or brown or something, and didn't think too, too much of it, but kept on watching them. Well, uh, they didn't fly in a conventional formation that's taught in our army. They, uh, they seemed to kind of weave in and out right above the mountaintop. And uh, I would say that they even went down into the canyons in several instances, well, probably 100 feet. But I could see them against uh, the snow, of course, on Mount Rainier, and against the snow on Mount Adams as they were flashing. 
and against a high ridge that happened to lay in between Mount Rainier and Mount Adams. But uh, when I observed the tail end of the last one passing Mount Adams, and I was at an angle uh, near Mount Rainier from it, but uh, I looked at my watch and it showed one minute and 42 seconds. Well, uh, I still thought, well, that's pretty fast, and I didn't stop to think what the distance was between the two mountains. Well, I landed at Yakima, Washington, and uh, Al Baxter was there to greet me, and he saw up here. And uh, <laughs> he told me, I guess I better change my brand. <laughs> Uh, but he, he kind of gave me a mysterious sort of a look that maybe I had seen something he didn't know. And, well, I just kind of forgot it then until I got down at Pendleton, and I, I began looking at my map and taking measurements on it. And the best calculation I could figure out, now even in spite of error, would be around 1,200 miles an hour, because making the distance from Mount Rainier to Mount Adams in, we'll say, approximately two minutes, it's almost, uh, well, it would be around 25 miles per minute. Now, allowing for error, we can give them three minutes or four minutes to make it, and uh, they're still going more than, than 800 miles an hour, and to my knowledge, there isn't anything that I read about outside of some of the German rockets that would go that fast. These were flying in more or less a level, uh, constant altitude. They weren't going up and they weren't going down. They were just simply flying straight and level, and I, uh, <laughs> I laughed when I told the pilot at Pendleton, I said, they sure must have had a tailwind, <laughs> but it didn't seem to help me much. But to the best of my knowledge and the best of my description, uh, that is what I actually saw. And uh, like I told the Associated Press, I'll, uh, I'd be glad to confirm it with my hands on a Bible because I did see it. And whether it has anything to do with our army or our intelligence or whether it has to do with some foreign country, I don't know. But I did see it, and I did clock it, and I just happened to be in a beautiful position to do it. And uh, it's just as much a mystery to me as it is to everyone else who's been calling me the last 24 hours wondering what it was. Well, Kenneth, <clears throat> thank you very much. I know that uh, you've certainly been busy in these last 24 hours because I've spent some of the time with you myself. And I know that the press associations, both Associated Press and our press, the United Press, has been uh, right after you every minute. Uh, the Associated and United Press all over the nation has been after this story. It's been on every newscast over the air and in every newspaper I know of. The uh, uh, United Press in Portland has made ter several telephone calls here to Pendleton to me and to you this morning. And uh, from New York, I understand they're after this story and that we may have an answer for it before night, because if it is some new type of Army or Navy uh, secret missile, there would probably a story come out on it from the Army or Navy asking, uh, saying that it is a new secret uh, plane, and that will be all there is to it, and they will hush up the story, or perhaps that uh, we will finally get a definite answer to it. I understand the United Press is checking on it out of New York now with the Army and also with the Navy, and we hope to have some uh, concrete answer before nightfall. I told you you'd be fascinated by that. Um, sorry about the audio quality. That was the original interview, and it took place uh, back in 1947, 1948. Um, so, yeah, it was a very old radio interview that he did. Um, now, about the Army investigation, the first uh, investigation into Arnold's claims came from Lieutenant Frank Brown and Captain William Davidson of Hamilton Field in California, who interviewed Arnold on July the 12th. Arnold also submitted a written report at the time regarding the reliability of Arnold's sighting. They concluded, and I quote, It is the present opinion of the interviewer that Mr. Arnold actually saw what he stated he saw. It is difficult to believe that a man of his character and apparent integrity would state that he saw an object or write up a report to the extent that he did if he did not see them. Despite this, the Army Air Force uh, formally publicly concluded that Arnold had seen a mirage. Also, the witness on the ground who saw the exact same thing saw a mirage. <laughs> Apparently, this is before the U.S. government changed it to, uh, it was swamp gas. <laughs> but anyway, I thought you'd be fascinated by that. Uh, if you've ever wondered where the term flying saucer or flying disc came from, it was from this original story. Now, at the end of this video, you're going to see uh, something that's new to my channel. I've initiated a Patreon account. Uh, why? Because 
um, as I stated in a previous video, I strongly uh, suspected that YouTube would demonetize a lot of my videos because they're about UFOs, aliens, extraterrestrials, etc., <laughs> etc. Et and of course, today they did. They demonetized uh, more than half of my videos. So, <laughs> I put a, pay, uh, a Patreon account down at the bottom. If you'd like to support my channel, please, I would really, really appreciate it. Um, y'all have a great day, and I'll see y'all later. Bye-bye.